Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 20 Live today. It's Saturday, August the 24th. Mm, Christmas is coming. Can't believe we're getting into the fall already, but it's so exciting you're sharing Saturday with us because today's topic is featured teacher, and our special guest today is Louise Morgan. And I think we just went through quickly that we don't have someone new to the session, but if you have a problem or a question, please feel free to type it into the chat because uh, Peggy's. Uh, very sharp on following up with questions along as with our uh, other hosts today. I'll remind you to thank you to Tammy Moore who is doing closed captioning for us and Laurie who will be uh, sharing the question and answer period and Kim is not able to be with us today. But thank you very much for everyone for attending. I go through this for the people who may not have attended our show and are watching the recording, but we do have a resource, the Classroom to Zero Live binary. That link is not active in the Slide, but Peggy has just dropped that link uh, at the in the chat for you to click on to because everything that uh, pretty well everything that Louise is sharing today is in that live binder. And as the show goes by and you share things in the chat, if it's a compliment today's session, we'll be adding your links as well to the live binder. And a reminder that most of it found our website live.class20.com, but uh, faithfully the blog posts, archives, and resources put up there by uh, Peggy with all the content for today's show, the full Blackboard Collaborate recording, an MP3 file, an embedded video, of course the chat log which is really good so if it flies back too quickly and you miss it, it's there. And uh, again, the links to the live binder is on that blog post as well as the links themselves that are shared during the session. So you don't miss out on anything from our archives and resources page. If you haven't already figured out where your laser pointer is. It's on the left hand side of the whiteboard, the second icon down. I need you to show us where you are in the world and if that um, laser pointer is not working, please type it in the chat for us. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario in Canada. Peggy's in Phoenix. I know our guest is in Crowley, Texas. And Laurie and Tammy are going to type in the chat where they're from because I'm terrible. My mind is vacant. Remembering the city, so Central PA. Great, thanks, Lori. And Tammy's in Arkansas. One of these days, I'm going to really remember that. Great, nice to see you spread across the nation a bit. I know that we have someone new today from uh, South America. So, Maria, welcome. One of the things we do in our show is some poll question, and the first one today is: Do you think you have enough tech in your classroom? So, just below, just above your name. There are four icons. The one on the right is the voting option. So if you click on it, you're going to get the drop down menu and choose yes or no to the question. Do you think you have enough tech in your classroom? And once you have voted, I'm going to just post the slide here to see their responses. And they are. More people saying they don't have enough tech. And so I'm sure you're going to be sharing your frustrations and your uh, celebrations about that topic. Our next question is, just let me clear the votes first. Do you participate in professional development on your own time? Green check if it's a yes and red X if it's a no. Let's see our results. Most people say they're doing it on their own and not many people are getting support. I'm just not quite sure that's how we read that, but a lot of people are uh, doing it on their own. So clearing the votes and go to our last poll question, which is do you do your students create individual blogs? Publish results again. And the majority of people in the session are not having your students create your individual blog. So I'm hoping that's going to help Louise um, with their presentation in a few minutes. So thanks very much for the poll questions. And we're going to move on to a formal introduction, which is my pleasure again as our featured teacher. Louise Morgan is in Crawley, Texas, and she works 
works for the in Crowley Independent School District. She's a second grade teacher who loves using social media. She was awarded Teacher of the Year 2012-13 at the Crowley Independent School District. She's also awarded the Crowley Independent School District Heartbeat Award 2013. She's a global classroom lead teacher and management team member. She's a moderator for a couple of uh, Twitter chats, uh, Pound Global Class Classroom, Pound Second Chat. She's one of the flat classroom judges and a Tisa Tots and Tech presenter in 2013. That's uh, Louise's link for her website and you can find her also as a Texas coordinator for MyTownTutors.com. So thank you very much Louise for being with us today. We welcome you and appreciate your work with us today. We always start out the featured teacher session with a newbie question which is why, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So this is my opportunity to turn the microphone over to you Louise and uh, Ready, set, go. Good morning. How are you? Thanks for coming, everybody. I really am excited to be here. I've always been on the uh, the other end. I've learned so much from Classroom 2.0 Live, and so now it's my turn to, to actually get to present, so I'm really excited about that. Um, class, uh, with 2.0, um, are tools that my second grade students will need to succeed and learn in the upcoming years. Uh, teaching them digital literacy and citizenship will help them be ready for whatever comes their way over the next few years. Our district has um, taken a very uh, cautious approach about what they are going to implement and do. And I'm very excited because this year they have gone one to one with iPads in the 7th through 12th grade uh, schools in our district. So I'm really excited to see what's going to be happening over the next few years in my district and hopefully that will trickle down into uh, the elementary level. But I am guess I'm getting my second graders ready for that and so um, that's, that's why I utilize it in my classroom. So do I just continue with my slides then? Yes, go right ahead. All right, good. So um, my presentation today is called Work With What You Know, or Work With What You Have. I, my title page is missing, but um, Work With What You Have. Um, who remembers back in 2011 in the spring when the Eagle Cam uh, was so popular? I know at our school a lot of teachers were having it pulled up in their classrooms. Uh, we were watching it. They had it pulled up in the, the cafeteria because their students were so fascinated with these eagles. They were sitting on the eggs. They were um, you know, just and it was just amazing to me um, how engaged they were and how inspired they were, and they wanted to learn more about eagles and how many good conversations we had and all of the the information that we learned just from watching these eagles sitting in their nests. And so, at the time, I was um, in my second year of teaching, and I thought to myself, "Gosh, what what could I do? What else could I do in my classroom that could get my kids this excited?" What, what could I bring to my classroom? And at the time, I only had a, a teacher computer in my classroom. And we had uh, a computer lab that we visited. And we went in there and did uh, math programs or, or reading programs. We didn't, you know, we would just utilize it for collecting data and for giving kids practice with, uh, with different skills. So um, that same year, our computer lab was renovated and they put these really nice flat screen computers in there. And so for about a week, the old computers, these big huge monitors and big huge CPUs were sitting out um, in the hallway of our uh, school. And I, I was, you know, it took me about a week to realize, you know what, I need some of these. So I grabbed two of them because that's all I had room for and I didn't want to, you know, get too excited and <laughs> take more than I should. So I took two of them and I put them in my classroom and I got them hooked up and it was towards the end of the school year so we didn't really use them that much. But I thought, you know, this is something that I could possibly integrate into my classroom for the following school year. So a computer lab renovation helped equip my room. And this is a picture from my classroom the first year that I started using tech in my classroom, using computers and and blogging and different things like that. So I had two uh, two uh, desktop computers here, and then usually I had a kid sitting at my desk using my my computer. And then the second year I got a third one, 
and then um, so anyway, so we had uh, you know just limited uh, computers in there, and they were the old computers. So the tools that I had going into the this first year where I decided I was going to incorporate tech into my classroom, I had two to three desktop computers. Um, later on, I was able to get two or three laptops. Um, we had one to two weekly visits to the computer lab. Uh, I had a projector and a camera, just a regular camera. And then later on, I got a webcam and a USB microphone through a Donors Choose project. So these were the tools that I've used in my classroom for the last two years. I also knew that when I uh, decided I wanted to use tech in my classroom, that I couldn't just, you know, just start using it randomly. I needed to make sure it was relevant. I needed to make sure it was standards-based. I didn't want to just start doing things that weren't um, based on what we needed to be doing uh, with our curriculum. I didn't want it as an extra or an add-on. I wanted it to be seamlessly integrated into my daily lessons. And I wanted it to be part of the lesson plan. I wanted it to just be something we just did naturally. So I, it required a lot of thinking on my part. The summer of 2011, I decided to um, really start learning. I got on Twitter. That's when I started blogging as a frugal teacher. And I learned so much just from being on Twitter, reading blogs, uh, doing live class uh, sessions. Um, I just, it was just really a good summer of learning. And as I learned new things, I was blogging about it. And I created a page on my frugal teacher called Becoming a Connected Educator. It was actually a countdown page. And so if you roll all the way to the bottom, you'll see my very first post. And then I just kept adding to it as I learned new things. About towards the end of the summer, I decided to set some goals. I had never set goals before for my classroom. And I decided I needed to set some goals and have something clear in my mind so I knew when school started, I was going to, if I had put these publicly, I would have to stick to them. So my goals were to implement all of the components of the Daily Five. And then I wanted to integrate student blogging into the work on writing component of the Daily Five. And then I wanted to Skype with other classrooms around the world. So that's just a little excerpt from my, my blog post. And I had put that I think 2011 is going to be the best one yet. And it really was. It was just such a great year because we were just doing so many new things. So the first leap, within the first two weeks of school, I decided we we're going to blog. So we had these old carts in our AV closet that hardly anyone ever used. They were full of laptops. So I thought, well, I'm just going to get those and just bring them down to my classroom. We're going to open them up. And I'll get all my kids on Kid Blog, and it will be great. Well, <laughs> what I didn't realize was that they all had to do control, alt, delete, and then they had to type in this really huge password, and they had to type in a username. And a lot of these kids had never used a laptop before. So this picture is a great picture of me leaning over a kid as I'm trying to get him into the computer. And then the other kids are sitting there waiting for the next instruction. So uh, we used those for two days, because when we finally did get into the laptop, then they'd start dying. Or you know they just weren't working quite the way I wanted them to. So I, and they took up a huge amount of room in my class. So we just decided uh, I just put them away. Eventually, last year we decided to disassemble those huge carts and we distributed the laptops among the classrooms. So that way, all of the classrooms had a couple extra laptops in their room instead of dragging the huge carts. So that's my first attempt, uh, first day of blogging. Uh, the blogging, I use Kid Blog for my kids. It's a really great platform. You just uh, go in there, you set it up, you add all of your kids as users. And what's really neat to see about the blogging is you go to the very first post where they can barely type their name to the very end of the year or even the middle of the year, and you can see the progress that they make. And I was able to use blogging as part of our work on writing in Daily Five, and so it just became part of our daily routine that whenever they were working on a writing piece and they would choose that center to go to, then they would just, um, just use it. And we, we really didn't have trouble. I only had two or three computers for them to do this on, but it would never seem to be an issue because kids were always at different stages of the writing process. 
So, and then I also encourage them to do blogging just like we would. They would come in with a very exciting story about a lost tooth, so I would say, well, why don't you go over and, and blog about it very quick, quickly and just tell us about it that way. So blogging is a really great um, thing for them to do to express themselves. And then as um, I started meeting other teachers and uh, getting involved with other uh, projects, I started connecting the blog to other classroom blogs. So that way they could visit other kids' blogs and make comments, and other kids could come visit their blogs and make comments. And this is just an example of a blog that one of my students did. And she learned how to change the color of the fonts. And then the two um, comments down there I thought were really good comments that um, they had made back because we had worked very, very, uh, we worked on doing good blogging comments, not just good job or great job uh, or I like your post. So we wanted to really, you know, start conversations with our, with our blogging. Um, then I also learned about VoiceThread. VoiceThread is a really good platform for collaborating with other classes. Um, it's a way for you to uh, share slides, videos, and other kind of media. Plus, then the kids can add their voices to it. So uh, I have my little USB microphone that I got from Donors Choose. And we joined a project on the Global Classrooms Project called Seasons Around the World that was created by Deborah Rosenquist. And so for a year, my kids, we had different groups, and each group uh, was a different season group. We had a fall group and a winter group and a spring group. And I did do this after school because it was so, it was an extra thing that I knew I couldn't work into my regular classroom. And it was also something I could do on a small group, and that way I could give my kids more attention. So I had, you know, five or six kids in each group after school. And we collected data, we studied the season. We made videos, we took pictures, and then we created this beautiful voice thread. The next year, I <laughs> you learn from your mistakes. Um, I was adding my new students to the voice thread account, and I thought, oh well, I'm just going to take these other kids off. They're not, you know, they're not going to be. I don't need them. They're not going to. They're they're in another grade now, and it gave me a warning to if you, you know if you delete them then. That are gone forever, and I went ahead and deleted them, and now by doing that, their comments are all gone. So it kind of made me sad to realize that because I'm sure that they would have enjoyed seeing this in the next couple of years as they've gotten older. So you learn from your mistakes. Sometimes you do things that you regret, so it's just, um, but we, it's always a good thing to learn from your mistakes. So VoiceThread is a really great um, platform for sharing and collaborating. And another project that I did last year that I worked with Lee Parkinson in the UK. Uh, we did Christmas Around the World. And it was a two-part project where we did Skyping. We, we created a Skype in the Classroom project, as well as uh, the final artifact for the project was the voice thread. And it's a beautiful voice thread. We have classrooms from around the world who have included slides and videos of how they uh, celebrate Christmas. And so it's something that we can use from year to year to show students that. And so it, it, it was just a really fun project to do and lots of participants and, and it was good. So VoiceThread is a great platform to use and, it's, and all you need is a computer and a microphone. Edmodo. Edmodo um, is a uh, platform that we've used. It's uh, great for projects like the Pen, the Admeto Pen Pal project that um, we're starting our third year with that with the Global Classroom project and that uh, was created by Tina Schmidt up in Pennsylvania and it's uh, she groups kids into different groups and then they uh, work on their communication skills using Edmodo. I used it last year also with the Global Read Aloud um, that Permanil Rip had uh, created and we read the one and only Ivan. And we had a little group of second grade uh, classrooms, and we talked and discussed the book and did some little activities together on Edmodo. And then last January, February, um, our second chat group decided to do a read aloud, and we did Clementine. And we used Edmodo to um, communicate with each other. So Edmodo is a really good platform. I don't really have any pictures or screenshots of it. But um, it, it is such a great tool to use, and I'm hoping to use it this year and maybe do some flipped classroom uh, activities with it 
and, and utilize it some more. I'll definitely use it again for the Global Read Aloud, which is coming up in October. And this year, we're going to read Marty McGuire by Kate Mesner. So at the end of the 2011-12 school year, I uh, was, had started Skyping. And I thought, well, you know, I'd like to do this project. We had learned. Um, we had learned so much once we started Skyping uh, in January from so many different people. We decided we learned um, how uh, we learned about Mardi Gras from a class in New Orleans. We learned about uh, some tribal dancing from the Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, Canada. And then we had a friend in Cape Town, South Africa, by the name of Steve Sherman, who would Skype with us and do brain teasers. And so it just opened up a whole lot of, of doors. And it, my kids loved it. And I was, we started in January, and I'm wondering why I didn't start sooner, because it was just such a great uh, way to, to bring people into the classroom that I would never, ever get to do otherwise. We, um, we Skyped with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And my kids asked him why, asked him why Pluto was no longer a planet. And then he happened to mention that he was friends with Bill Nye. And so one of my students boldly asked him if Bill Nye could Skype with us. <laughs> I never really heard back from Bill Nye on that. We also Skyped with an astronaut, a uh, former astronaut, Dr. Thomas. And that was set up by our friend in South Africa, Steve Sherman. So lots of great opportunities came to us through Skype. And I'm going to go back to this view stream. So Cinco de Mayo is in May. It's the 5th of May. And it's really a kind of a celebration that happens in Texas. Uh, and it's a, it's a Mexican celebration. And I wanted to learn more about it. And I wanted my kids to learn more about it. And then we wanted to teach the rest of the world. So I thought, well, we'll do this as a Skype project. Well, we had so much interest in it. And I thought, we can't do 20 individual Skype presentations. So I was trying to brainstorm. And I was asking some of my fellow teachers on, um, you know, that, I, that I collaborate with what I could use. And so one of them suggested Ustream. So we worked hard. I uh, worked with a, Gabriel Verone, who was a bilingual second grade teacher in my school. And we did a presentation um, about Cinco de Mayo, both in English and Spanish. We did the presentation. We talked about food, history, clothing, dance, music, you know, all the whole the whole gamut. And then afterwards, we had a big feast. All the parents brought all the authentic food in. It was just a really fun day. But we streamed it live through Ustream. And the recording's still there. And then what I also did was I set up a Google Doc so we could get feedback from other people. And on this Google Doc, we have comments and feedback from uh, classrooms in Germany, from classrooms all over the United States, from uh, all different countries. Um, and so it was really a cool thing to, for my kids to know that we were sharing something and people from around the world were watching it. So Ustream was a really good platform for that. Let me skip ahead here. Uh, another way that we use Mystery Skype, uh, Skype is through doing Mystery Skype or Mystery Location. And that's where the students use their map skills and their communication skills to find a mystery location of the other class. And so this, we did one of those at least once a week last year during the school year. And this, the picture of the map is my classroom map. Um, and we did, that's about a couple months into the school year. By the end of the school year, we had many more pins and strings. It was very sad taking them down at the beginning of the school year because we had so many up there. Um, one night, I had my students and their parents come back to school at 7 o'clock so we could do a mystery Skype. Um, and I had set it up with a classroom in Australia. Unfortunately, we had some problems, some bandwidth problems, and we weren't able to uh, get a connection. My husband was on his phone communicating through an instant messaging Skype group that we belong to. And he was able to get another friend of ours, Ann Merchant, in uh, Australia to get one of her students or two of her students to, to Skype with us. So it actually worked out really well. And my students showed their parents how they mystery Skype. And we got to add Australia as a pin on our map. So that was very exciting. So another way to keep the communication and can keep the, 
the connection with those classrooms going is to do other activities with them. So we mystery Skype with the class, we learn where they live, then we go back and do something else with them. And mystery number Skype is a great one. We uh, have a mystery number and the other class has to try to guess that mystery number. And so we had a lot of fun with that at the end of the school year and we did teams and we made it a fun competition. And then on my, uh, that link down there is actually a page which explains exactly how to do it. And it's, it's a lot of fun and it's a great way to, to Skype and, and continue connections with, with classrooms. Last year in the spring, the second chat group also did a little project using Snowman at Night. There were five classrooms uh, in North America that participated. And we had read Snowman at Night and we did some projects in our classroom. We uh, blogged about it and we commented on each other's blogs. But then we also did a progressive story called What Stuffed Animals Do at Night. So we kind of took the idea of Snowman at Night and we thought, wonder what stuffed animals do at night while we're sleeping. Let's make up a story. And so we used a Google Doc for that and it was perfect. One class started it, it went to the next class, and it went to the next class, and it was perfect because we didn't have to do email, we didn't have to do anything other than just pull up the document. And so it turned out to be a really cute story, and the uh, students drew pictures, and then we decided to create, oh, I don't think I have a picture of it, this is a picture of the, the screen. We created a voice thread, and the link for the voice thread is there, it's on the live binder as well. We created a voice thread, and they narrated the story and then added the pictures in. So that was a really fun, and I really felt like the kids were very involved with that one and it became true collaboration. And so that's what we're moving towards, not just, you know, I'm putting this on the computer, you look at it, you comment. It's more, let's all work together and create something together. Creation, collaboration, and that's really the, what we want. That's what we want to work towards. Google Hangouts uh, is another video conferencing platform and it's wonderful for collaboration. So when uh, the five teachers in second chat decided to do this project, one Sunday afternoon we all did a Google Hangout and it was like we were all sitting around a kitchen table talking. It was wonderful. So we were able to plan and discuss and kind of uh, assign duties for each other and it was so much easier doing it that way than trying to do it on a Twitter chat or, you know, or something like that. So Google Hangouts allows you to video conference with up to 10 different people. And the nice feature with that too is if you want to do something that you want more than 10 people to participate in, it can also be recorded live and you can watch it live on YouTube and then it becomes a recording. So one morning, my fourth grade, well, the fourth graders at our school were doing a writing camp in preparation for the state test. And so they asked me if I would uh, kick it off. And so I asked Dave Roman, who is a graphic novelist, he's done Astronaut Academy and he, he's uh, just an amazing artist and does just these wonderful graphic novels. I asked him if he would Skype with us. Well, Skype wasn't working, so we switched over to Google Hangouts and that worked out really well. And so my kids were able to, to interact with him and you see I just had it on a laptop. We did project it up on the big screen, but um, <laughs> the setup there is certainly just a regular setup, nothing fancy. It's just a, and that's a, a, my computer from home because it has a webcam already installed in it. But you can use a separate webcam if you don't have that. The, web, the, the laptops at our school do not have webcams in them. So I use a free a USB webcam that attaches separately. But for this case, we were in the library, so I just went ahead and brought in my own computer. And that was a really fun day for them. And that was the first time a fourth grader said Skyped. Um, that little girl was actually in my second grade class two years ago, and she asked me, why didn't we do this when, we, when I was in your class? And I said, well, I wasn't ready. So you're probably thinking, where does she learn all this? And how does she know how, how to do this? And I've, I've already mentioned a little bit of blogging, uh, becoming really involved with Twitter and Twitter chats, um, being involved in the Global Classroom Project. Um, there's a group of educators around the world who um, talk daily on a Skype instant messaging called Hello Little World Skypers, um, participating in live Classroom 2.0 projects, um, attending ed camps. I attended my first ed camp a couple of weeks ago here in Fort Worth and it was amazing. It was just, it, it was the best 
day of professional develop, development I think I had ever participated in. It was it was just really cool. You go in, you everybody puts sticky notes on the wall about what they want to um, learn about, and then they set the schedule that way. I even ended up facilitating a group about Genius Hour, so that was kind of cool. They didn't have anybody to do that, and there was another teacher and I who were familiar with it, and we went in, and it it was it was just really a great experience. So. Um, there's a link on the live binder for the EdCamp wiki, and there are ed camps all over the world, and so you can find one. There's one coming up in Dallas in October, which I'm going to. I also uh, am a member of the TCEA, which is the Texas Computer Education Association, and I'm sure most states have a similar type of organization. And then I presented at their Texas uh, Tots and Tech Conference, which is a conference specifically for Kin, uh, K through five, and so I presented about blogging and Skype and creating a global classroom. So attending these conferences and attending other sessions and learning from other teachers is a great way. And then this year I I got to actually attend ISTE. For the last several years, I followed the the tweets from ISTE attendees and always thought that that would be a really great thing to go to. So I. My husband and I got to go this year, and it was it was amazing. And we're already planning out next year, deciding how we would do it differently and what would we do better because it is just so big and there's so much going on there. But it was just a great couple of days of learning. And then did I mention Twitter? Twitter is a great place. Twitter chats. Um, anytime you can get on there and connect with educators and learn from them, and even just you know getting on there and clicking on links that people are really it's just amazing what you can learn. And so again, I I wanted to set goals for this upcoming year. Um, I think I'm pretty comfortable with what I have, um, what I'm going to use. I'm not going to add too much new in, uh, just because I'm comfortable with with what I have. And uh, I don't even have my laptops right now in my classroom. I don't have any computers. Hopefully, we're going to get a few of the laptops back that we had last year, but they were sent off for for uh, refurbishing, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know when we're going to get them, but we still have our computer lab. Um, but what I'm looking to do is to take it to the next level. I want my project to be more collaborative in nature. I want to establish ongoing relationships with other classrooms. Uh, there's a lot of times when we miss recess with a classroom, and then we never talk to them again. It's you know we just it, and I want it to be more than just a pin on the map. I want it to be a classroom that we can go back to and say, oh, this is a classroom we talked to in Washington State. Remember Washington State? Let's ask them about the volcanoes up there. You know, and so I want them, I want it to be a, a more, more meaningful relationships with classrooms. And I want our projects um, to be, to be, our, our work to be project based and inquiry based where the students are, are, um, are creating and asking questions and and uh, finding their passions and and doing that. So I'm going to work towards that. I participate in the Genius Hour chat. I've read uh, Dave Burgess's book, P Teach Like a Pirate. And I don't have any of that information on the live binder. I just thought about it right now. But things like that that I've learned um, through Twitter and, and other teachers, um, it's, it's just, uh, just taking it to the next level. But this will be my third year in, with using tech in my classroom. So I'm ready for that. Uh, I wasn't ready for that. I, you know, I look back at my goals from two years ago, and I think, gosh, you know, implementing blogging in my classroom—that's an easy one. Well, it wasn't at the time. I was very, very scared about doing that. So it's just a matter of just taking that leap and and and, uh, and doing it. And then I want my my students to be more creative, to to be creating um, things that are more personal to them and uh, more unique. So that is my presentation. I am more than happy to take any questions that you have uh, about this. I kind of breezed through these slides and I was a little nervous because um, I'm just, that's how I am. You're not second graders, so I'm <laughs> your adult, so I tend to be a little bit more nervous. So, but I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have um, with anything that I Hey, thank you very much, Louise. I know that we have a few questions in the chat, but I'm going to turn the mic over to Lori, who's going to work through the questions with you. Hello. 
Great. Um, most of the questions, Louise, you already answered during your presentation, but I do have a couple here. Uh, what are you planning to do with inquiry-based learning? That's a good question. <laughs> so I've been learning a lot about project-based learning. Second Chat and the Global Classroom chats this past month were about project-based learning. So it's getting your students to um, be more hands-on with their learning um, and asking more questions. Uh, and, and you can do this with um, a lot of different um, subject matters and things like that. So it's, instead of just passive learning, it's more an active way to learn. And so I'm hoping to incorporate some of that into my classroom this year. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like just yet, uh, but I'm, that's one of my goals. And on our Second Chat Wiki, uh, gosh, on the Second Chat Wiki, I have a project-based learning page that uh, has tons of links that will help you know what it is, and then also um, give you ideas for doing that as well. It could just be, um, and it's just, you know, it's teaching the kids to be collaborate, more collaborative uh, and work together. And then also, it, to me, it goes hand in hand with, uh, there's the link. It goes hand in hand with Genius Hour, which is the concept of giving kids an hour a week to work on what they want to work on. It came from the from the Google. Uh, Google gives their employees 20% of their time to work on anything that they want to work on that's not in their regular job description. So Genius Hour that uh, is a thing that stu uh, teachers do in their classroom to um, encourage creativity in their students. Were there any other questions, Lori? Yes, there were a couple others. Um, Peggy asked about how much of the school day or week do you spend on Genius Hour? Uh, Genius Hour, at the very end of the school year, what I did was I kind of, it's more of a project-based type Genius Hour where I actually kind of gave the, the parameters. Mm -hmm. A true genius hour is something where a student says, I want to learn about what makes an air conditioner in a car work. And then they go about the task of learning about it on their own. You give them time to do that. Of course, you guide them and help them. But they choose what they're doing. Well, second graders are seven and eight years old, so they need a little bit more guidance. So towards the end of the year, as I was learning about genius hour, um, what I did was we talked about vehicles and what vehicles can do and what they are and what kinds of vehicles there are. And then I gave my kids a lot of building materials, Legos, Connects, Tinker Toys, uh, paper, glue. Uh, just We just put out all kinds of materials. And we worked for an hour um, a week. And I actually gave them more time than that because I'd give them time in the morning to work on it. And they created their own vehicles. And then they had to blog about their vehicle and say what their vehicle did. And they, you know, if they added something cool, well, you know, one of my kids had kids you know, added a coffee maker and a <laughs> to his hovercraft and different things like that. So they were able to get creative with the building materials and things. And so that was my first attempt at using mm -hmm. project-based learning and Genius Hour in my classroom. And so I'm hoping, again, to just move it to the next level where maybe they come up with the idea of what they're going to do. And do your students then work on those projects at home? That sounds like something they would continue to do with the building they could the vehicles. Work on it. Yes, and they can work on it at home, but I, I mostly did it at school. And mm -hmm. so I would give them the first you know, few minutes in the morning when they would come in, and then we would take time. Sometimes in the afternoon, I'd give them 20 minutes or so to work on it. So it's just a, a little extra you know, time that, that uh, we find the time. Okay. I think it is important to find the time for something like that. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked about your um, Skype tasks, assignments, roles. How do you figure out what student does what? 
uh, it's really easy to figure out. We usually we started out doing whole group Skype sessions, and it's easy to figure out who gets whose attention span does not <laughs> does not <laughs> stay with. I've learned with second graders, 20 minutes is the the, the most amount that you really could buy that after 20 minutes they start getting antsy. Um, and then it, especially with mystery Skype, you'll see who is better at different tasks. And so there will be mm -hmm. some kids that ask the question. There will be some kids that are working at the maps. And so they each have the different roles and it's just based on the strengths and the weaknesses. Uh, then towards the end when we started doing mystery number, what I started doing was having smaller groups and so the other kids would be working on something else and then I would just have a small group come up and do the mystery Skype so then that way because when you're in a whole group situation with 20 kids it can get uh, you know you you have the, if, the, if, if the kids who aren't actually participating tend to talk and be less engaged so uh, I am going to probably move into more small group Skype sessions this year so that you can start out with whole group, but then move it to smaller group type sessions. And, okay. And 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes is what they should be limited to for, for younger kids. How much prep time does it take you to arrange a, or to set up a Skype session with a new classroom? And how many do you do in a month, for example? I tried to do, at the beginning of the year, I tried to do at least one a week. Um, on our Global Classroom Wiki, we have a Mystery Skype uh, page, and it's a, there's a, a link to a Google spreadsheet that has uh, over 100 contacts on there, and it's all uh, separated out by continents and time zones. And so, and their contact information is on there. And so um, it's really easy to find another class to connect with. Another way that you can find classes is if you just follow the mystery Skype or mystery location hashtag on Twitter. So there's, there's it's, and you'll find, you, if, you, you, if you follow those hashtags on Twitter, you'll find people, uh, I need a class in Iowa to Skype with, or I, you know, I'd, um, I live in, or I live in Louisiana, I want a mystery Skype with my kids tomorrow. And so mm -hmm. it's very easy to set that up. Um, on, we also have a mystery Skype, Skype instant messaging group where there's a lot of collaborating and planning going on there as well. So, so if you sign up on there, and then you, we can add you to that, that group as well. So it's very easy to find classes to mystery Skype with. That's great. Those were the questions that I was able to capture. Great. Great. I just, you know, I, I was, um, I just really wanted to make the point that even if you don't have very much in your classroom, there's just so much you can do with, with little what you have. And the other thing is that it becomes part of the classroom routine. It's not anything extra. Uh, you know, Mystery Skype is, I can cover technology standards, English language arts standards, and social studies standards just with one 20 minute Skype session. It's, you know, there's just so many different skills that are involved with, with, with Mystery Skype alone, but then blogging as well. Um, before I started using the computers the way I, I do in my classroom, I was barely hitting the, the tech standards. You know, I wasn't hitting hardly any of them. But now I'm able to cover just about every single tech standard that for second grade um, with, with what we're doing. So, and I, I, my advice is just to start small. Blogging was the perfect way for me to start because, uh, you know, I was able to just work it right into the writing. And it made it exciting for the kids. So many students, you know, give them their writing journal and they, <laughs> they don't, they'd rather draw in it, and which is fine, but uh, they, Writing is, is very difficult for some students, and so you add that blogging into it, and then if they do draw a picture to go with their writing, you take a picture, and then you add the picture to their blog post, and then their parents can see it. And so, I don't know about y'all, but how many times have you helped a kid clean out their backpack and you find papers in there that have been in there for six weeks that nobody's looked at except for you, with you know a pink smiley face on it, and 
that's all the feedback they've gotten. You put it on a blog post, not only and I send the link to the parent, look what your child did, they can go to the link and they can make a comment and they get feedback from their parents and they can get feedback from kids their own age and from other teachers um, in both the building and in um, other classrooms. So uh, it's just blogging is just a really great place to start with uh, bringing that into your classroom. Thanks, Louise. I just want to know if there's anyone in this session that uh, would like to come to the mic and share what they're doing as well. Not give them mic permissions. All you have to do is uh, raise your hand and I'll know if you'd like to join us. It helps to have a headset USB, but um, you can do a walkie-talkie if you don't. I don't need you to be shy. <laughs> I see Wes is with his, on his phone. It's kind of interesting to look at the list of participants. Some people are on the iPads and some people are using their uh, mobile phone devices. That's the nice thing about Blackboard Collaborate. Lorna, a question did pop up okay. in chat after I had said I okay, captured ahead. them all. Okay. What do what you do to get permission no. from parents to Skype with their kids? Um, yes. At the very beginning of the year, I have a permission slip that I send home and I tell them all of the things that we're going to be doing in the classroom and I get permission from them and uh, to use their photos and they know that I blog. We have the class blog and also a frugal teacher. I never identify them by name. In a lot of the class pictures that I take, I try to take from the back or from the side. But even, um, you know, if I have face pictures, um, most parents are okay with me using that um, as long as I, I don't identify them by name. On their class blogs, uh, I try not to use their pictures. I take pictures of their work and then even their little avatar picture. This year they had were holding up little mustaches and hats and other things in front of their face so there wasn't a full face uh, picture on there. But um, I haven't ever had a parent request that I not use their picture. So that's, uh, but it's just, I just tell them up front what we're going to be doing. Okay, and somebody else asked about EdCamp. Um, this person's been to some where people offered sessions and some where people posted what they wanted to know. Did you have a good match between what people wanted to learn about and the people willing to facilitate those sessions? Yes, at the last EdCamp that I went to, of course, tech is the, the big subject, but there were other people who were wanting to learn about guided reading or more about bilingual education and, and different uh, subjects like that, uh, just good practices in, in classrooms. So uh, it was, yeah, most of the, the sessions were full. I think the one that I went to, we had some of the Twitter rock stars there. So of course those were the ones that everybody wanted to go to and learn about some of the really cool tools. And you know, there's some great tools out there that I can't use yet because, you know, we just don't have what we need in our classroom to, to use those tools. But I learn about them so that at some point I'll be ready for them. Uh, but yeah, the ed camps do tend to, it seems like it, it provides something for everybody. Great, thank you. Right, and Peggy said the neat thing in that ed camp is that conversations can go wherever where you want it to. Right, so it's not like, you know, you don't go there with a slide presentation, you don't go there prepared. Uh, now, when uh, Laura Rausch and I facilitated the Genius Hour presentation, well, session, uh, but there were a lot of people who were not familiar with that, but she had her computer and so she pulled up the computer and shared a lot of uh, like the live binder that Joy Kerr has created for Genius Hour and Robin Tyson's uh, project, uh, the Global Classroom Genius Hour project. Uh, so we were able to share that kind of information uh, that way, but it wasn't anything that we had prepared ahead of time. And that's kind of the beauty of EdCamp. It's just kind of an impromptu thing. Now there were some sessions, uh, Todd Nesloni, he's the, the Tech Ninja Todd, had 
presented about Erasmus, and he came prepared to do that because so many people had expressed interest ahead of time. You know, Todd, are you going to show us about Erasmus? It's this really cool augmented reality app that you can use. And so a lot of people wanted to learn about that. So he came ready to, to wow us, and he did. And that was a fun session. So things like that uh, go, go on there at a camps. Okay. Thanks, Louise. I was still trying to see if we could get Wes to come on with his phone so it shares experience there. I would love Robin Tyson to tell us more about her Genius Hour project. Well, let's ask Robin to come to the mic. Is she? I'm just waiting to see if she's going to, she she's going to try great. She's never at a loss for words. She needs to get on there. <laughs> I think she's running the wizard right now to make sure she's all set to go. Okay, is that working, guys? Yes, it is. Okay, awesome. I do, I'm just using uh, my laptop. Well, uh, I met Louise last year through the Global Classroom Project. Yay, Louise. And we did the mystery numbers Skype uh, together, had a great time with our class. Uh, I also do Genius Hour in my room, um, my student's favorite time of the week. Uh, every Wednesday afternoon was dedicated to that. And I had a passion for Genius Hour and a passion for global collaboration. So I put the two together in a project called the Global Classroom, uh, the Global Genius Hour Project. And uh, it's a wiki, so you can just look that up. It uh, allows for teachers and students to share their genius with other people on the wiki and for teachers to connect to each other and their students to have conversations around Genius Hour. Uh, we have over 50 classes uh, from all over the world on the project right now and it's also listed on the Global Classroom Project uh, wiki. And on my class you can see samples of uh, my student work. Uh, on MrsThiessen.com, MrsThiessen'sClass.com um, is where uh, some of my students' work is located, as well as on uh, the Global Genius Hour Wiki. Thanks, Thanks. Louise, for giving me an opportunity there to share that stuff. I'm much, much appreciated. Thanks, Robin. We really appreciate you sharing your ideas. Now we did get uh, Louise sharing the link about uh, the project with each other. And Peggy's asking, anyone else want to come to the mic? Okay, Wes is saying okay. I'm interested to see as well. So I think he has my per permissions. Oh, okay. Hey, I think this one's working now. I'll just uh, say real quick that you know being able to Skype now from the iPhone is is awesome. Um, a week, two weeks ago, I was in Chicago and set up Skype in my wife's um, third through fifth grade classroom, and I Skyped with her students from. Um, the river in Chicago where the kids uh, saw the, the water taxis going by and kayaks people were in. And then I went to the Nike store on Michigan Avenue which has all 28 versions of the Air Jordan shoe ever made. And uh, we toured up all four levels and some of the employees there talked to the kids about what they did and what, they, what sports they played in college and, and what they do for Nike and designing shoes. And so anyway, that kind of thing about being able to have somebody from their phone um, if you're in an urban area that has, you know, higher speed cellular connections, um, was just amazing. It was awesome. So that was was cool, and I hope you know that we'll see more more folks doing that, being able to bring in a virtual experience like that. And then, of course, you know, if your students are on a field trip, they could have that opportunity too to be able to to Skype back to school or to other classrooms to be able to share. Thanks, Wes. I still think it's really exciting that you're just sitting there with a mobile device 
right onto Blackboard Collaborate and sharing in just a, a matter of seconds. Technology, uh, absolutely. Is great. It, it's, and I'll just say it's amazing. I mean, I'm literally we're at Dick's Sporting Goods uh, shopping for a tennis racket, you know, and my kids are like, "This is really weird. You're on this show, you know, listening to this." Um, it's the the whole mobilizing learning, um, you know and taking that with Skype with the virtual field trips, but then also, you know, the great Saturday learning you all do. It's it's just awesome. So if people haven't tried that and checked that out, I think that's it's something to something to check out and something maybe to talk to parents about in your class too, because if they have a smartphone, you know, they might be going on a trip or even if they're just at their place of work, you know, being able to briefly give a window into here's what I do, here's what I like about my job. Anyway, that that kind of thing with mobile phones, you know, it's it's never been that as good as it is today and as easy. So that's it's another aspect of that, you know, bringing bringing the classroom together and then bringing parents into the classroom and with their experiences. Very very true. And I appreciate you looking for the tennis racket and talking to us at the same time. How fun is that? I, I hope you make a good choice and we didn't interfere with the the mind process of. Uh, having your right time and you've been doing a lot of sharing on Facebook so I really want to send people off. If you're not following Wes on Facebook, you should be because he's got some great information that he shares for us all day long. So thanks very much Wes and uh, I think we're close to the top of the hour so I'm going to formally close out the session today and uh, give you a heads up on the future of education interviews that Steve Hargan is having this week coming up in the following August 27th uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern, David Marshak on self-designed education. Moving into September the 3rd on a Tuesday, Michelle Cordy on hacking your classroom. Then on to September the 10th on a Tuesday, Doug Johnson on the indispensable librarian. And as far as our shows are concerned, uh, Peggy's giving us a heads up and I'll show you the slide in a minute. There is a homeschool conference going on right now and uh, you can participate in that. It's free. We'll not have a show next week, August the 31st, because of Labor Day weekend here in uh, Canada and the United States, but we'll move on to September 7th, again, Saturday at noon with Colleen King in the Math Playground Revisited, an excellent presentation before, and she's going to give more of the same good things. Then we're fortunate to have Adam Bella from EduClipper, and uh, September the 14th, then Again, no show on the 21st for the Global STEM X conference. And then at the end of the month, our featured teacher will be Zoe Midler. So great shows coming up for you. And here's the information. I think Peggy's going to drop that link in for the homeschool conference and participating in that. And a reminder again about uh, nominating a featured teacher. Please feel free to do that. I didn't mention anyone new. Listening, we do have the live binder and all the class and zero resources are there. So there's a link for the form for nominating a featured teacher, as well as a survey uh, that will pop up at the end of the show. And on the survey, you can share your comments with us, uh, questions that you might have, and a request for a professional development certificate, which Peggy faithfully sends out to you. And she just requests that you use your own personal email address because she has problems with uh, corporate or uh, school board emails, sometimes seeing her uh, email with a professional development cer certificate as a spam. Again, a reminder, we do have uh, iTunes View channels, a video and audio collection, and the link is there for it. And very helpful, I think you'll find, if you find that blog post, archives and resources, the RSS feed for you to grab that and have daily updates is uh, weekly, I guess because we'll post weekly uh, in your own inbox. So it's my opportunity to send out a special thank you, Louise, for your presentation. I know, know that the work that went before it is a very busy week for you, and we really appreciate the time you were able to take up the day and join us to Steve for, as the founder of Class 2.0. Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, Web 2.0 Lab Projects. He's given us the uh, inspiration and the drive to continue this project, along with Weebly for providing our website, for Blackboard Collaborate for giving us the platform to, be in, to meet him weekly, and to all of you who took time today to share your ideas or just participate, we are very happy that you could be with us today. So with that, any final comments you'd like to share, Louise? 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to share what uh, what I'm doing in my classroom. I'm really excited about it. I'm looking forward to a great year again and learning some new things and doing some some new things. And I'll be can't wait to share it all on Twitter and my blog and everywhere else. So thanks again. And thank you again to Louise. So at that, I'm going to uh, wish you all a, another happy Saturday for the time that uh, you have to spend with uh, your families or out there out and about. Some people are shopping for tennis rackets, and maybe you'll join join that uh, adventure. But thank you very much, everyone, for being with us, and we'll see you again next week at the same time. Nope, we won't see you next week at the same time because it's Labor Day weekend. Okay, my head's straight. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.